I'm rolling. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome. We're here with Stephen Travers, who's the author of The Duke, The Longhorns, and Chairman Mao, John Wayne's Political Odyssey. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much, Andrew. Okay. So what pr I'm going to get right into this. What proof is there that international communism infiltrated Hollywood? Well, the first thing I want to address is the nature of communism. Let's understand something. Uh, communism is something, I, I suppose you could say that it started with the uh, publication of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, Rousseau's book, The Social Contract in the mid-19th century, becomes the French Revolution in 1789, formulates a series of revolutions in uh, Europe, mainly throughout the 19th century, mainly in 1848, which leads to Karl Marx writing uh, various books on Marxism. And communism, as we know, it starts in the Soviet Union in 1917, um, and its, its father really is V.I. Lenin. Now, it's under, the, the thing that is important to understand is what is communism and what, is, what has it wrought upon this world? Well, communism is responsible for the murder of 120 million human beings. It's important to understand what that means. Adolf Hitler, for instance, killed 12 million people in the Holocaust, six million, 6 million of whom were Jewish. Joseph Stalin killed 35 million people in the Soviet Union. Now, we don't have exact records, but I would venture to guess that at least 6 million of those people were Jewish, especially considering that he had a very strange and odd purge against Jewish doctors in the late 1940s and early 1950s during a time which Stalin was going through a period of madness, which relates to the later events that I'm going to talk about with John Wayne and an assassination attempt against him. So we have 120 million people. Now, for instance, 60 million people were killed uh, among all the dead of World War II. Um, civilians, uh, uh, casualties, uh, collateral damage, uh, war dead, all the different countries, South Pacific and Europe. 40 million were killed in uh, World War I. 60 million children have been aborted since Roe versus Wade in the United States alone since 1973. About the same number of people that's died in World War II. Uh, and I would guess, there's no real record, I would have guessed that a billion children have been aborted in Red China, considering their population and their sterilization policy. So we now have some idea of what communism is. It's killed 120 million human beings. So let's go to Vietnam and ask why were we in Vietnam? Well, I don't know if we should have been in Vietnam, and I don't know if we fought the Vietnam War correctly. I do know that opposing something that killed 120 million human beings is the right thing to do. So this is the premise that where I, I go on my book. So now we get to the question is how do we know that um, there were communists infiltrating Hollywood in the 1920s. Well, we start with a statement made by V.I. Lenin in 1920. He says, of all the arts, uh, cinema is the most important. Now, this is very important because we're starting to understand that cinema, film, the capturing moving images, and then later moving images where they could talk, which happens around 1929, 1930, is the most visually arresting and emotionally evocative aspect of the arts ever, more so than Shakespeare, more so than the great novelists of Russia itself, or uh, stage plays, or, or the great uh, wonderful classics of Tchaikovsky, classical music. And he recognized this. Now we have Hollywood, which is in the 20s and 30s, uh, is an aspect of entertainment and of uh, movie stars. Hollywood is mainly built by Jewish people whose parents or grandparents or ancestors had escaped the shtetls of Eastern Europe, come to the United States, and somehow forged a life for themselves. And these people were gamblers who start Hollywood, and they love America, and they want to make movies that develop the propaganda idea of this nation being the greatest nation on earth because they are so they love it so much. Now we have the Nazis and the Soviets, who in the 1930s realize that the propaganda value of movies is extremely important and could do more than any other aspect of, of their policy. The 
Nazis, of course, with the documentaries of Lenny Riefenstahl, created uh, a lionized image of Adolf Hitler. And the same thing happens with the Soviets. The Soviets start making a series of propaganda movies that glorify the R Russian Revolution of 1917-1918. This later leads to the questions that I address with John Wayne, which we'll get to. Now, evidence. We start with a man named Whitaker Chambers. Whitaker Chambers was a communist who lived in Baltimore in the 1920s. He was the editor of the Daily Worker, which was a communist newspaper. At some point in the late 20s, early 30s, he is approached by handlers from the Soviet Union who say, we want you to now be a spy. We don't want you to just be a propagandist. We want you to be a spy. They give him a handle. His handler is a man named Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss is a Harvard attorney. He's a young up-and-coming fellow in the Works Projects Administration in the Roosevelt Administration uh, in the 1930s. The WPA is rife with communists. And at some point, a truth becomes known by Whitaker Chambers. And this truth is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when this truth becomes known by Whitaker Chambers, Whitaker Chambers suddenly knows exactly what he wants. He has to do. He has to go to the FBI. He has to tell them that Alger is a communist, that he's working for the Soviet Union. And that uh, this must be stopped. Oddly enough, he does do this, but Hiss continues to rise and eventually more or less forms the United Nations in 1945 and basically sells out Eastern Europe. All these years, Whitaker Chambers is wondering, how come the FBI never did anything about Alger Hiss? Well, he finds out later um, that J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, did know about Alger Hiss, and, but he did not want to expose Hiss directly because he had bigger fish to fry. He was going after uh, aspects of the Soviet apparatus that he had to get to. So he told Richard Nixon, who was uh, investigating on behalf of Hiss, uh, I can't help you per se, but you're hitting in the right direction. We get back to the question of evidence which is found in the 1952 book, Witness, written by Whitaker Chambers. And also, very important, 1943, the uh, military uh, investigative services began to follow cable traffic of the Soviet Union. They, what they basically found was that the Soviets were um, talking to the Germans about a possible second Hitler von Ribbentrop pact. Uh, they were our allies, they were fighting the Soviets in uh, Russia, but if they were to stop fighting Nazi Germany, and suddenly perhaps even join forces with Nazi Germany, then it would be very difficult for the United States. So these members of the, of the military intelligence began to follow ca Soviet cable traffic. And in following Soviet cable traffic, they find out a number of things. They find out that there are high-ranking Soviets and traitors in the Roosevelt administration, They're high up as the Oval Office, and they begin to find um, tracks of Soviet espionage. It's entering Hollywood, it's entering academia, it's entering government, it's entering all various aspects of their life. Chambers knows all about this because he has been involved from the very beginning in Soviet apparatuses as a member of this apparatus. And he knows just how important Hollywood and the arts and culture and academia are in terms of propaganda value to the Soviet Union. So this is the first aspect of where we see evidence of uh, Soviet infiltration into Hollywood in the 1930s and the 1940s. And then next, Ronald Reagan and John Wayne themselves saw it up close. Um, John Howard Lawson, who was with the, uh, one of the blacklisted writers, was a paid Soviet agent. All of the blacklisted writers were known communists. Uh, even though there were only 10 of those, one has to imagine there were probably far, far more that were never caught, that we don't know about, and continue to, to do what they did. And then there were many others who were just considered fellow travelers. They really couldn't be convicted of anything. Some of them were blacklisted, some of them weren't. Uh, a lot of them went over to France and worked in the uh, 
French New Wave cinema of the 50s and early 60s. Ronald Reagan himself uh, was dealing with unions. Uh, there were communists who uh, threatened to throw acid in his face because he was exposing them. Uh, they were calling John Wayne in the middle of the night, threatening him because he was exposing them, the speeches that he was making. So this is the first area of uh, evidence that I uncovered on the fact that there was infiltration of Hollywood by the Soviet Union. Well, that sort of moves us on to the next question here, is, is what proof is there that international communism attempted to assassinate John Wayne? Okay, well, we start with the association of John Wayne uh, with communism and how it comes to the, uh, the view of the Soviet Union. In the late 1930s, uh, Joe Stalin wanted to make a movie uh, about the Russian Revolution, and he found a screenwriter named Kapler, and he asked Kapler to write a screenplay. It ended up two different movies. One was called Lenin in 1918, I think the other was uh, Moscow in October, something along those lines. I don't remember the exact name. And they were actually uh, quite well done, propaganda movies on behalf of the Soviet Union. And it turns out that Le uh, Stalin's young daughter falls in love with Kapler, and um, Stalin was not happy with this because Kapler was Jewish, and Stalin hated Jews. So he sends Kapler to the gulags at a place called Vorkuna, somewhere in Siberia, I believe. Now, we fast forward to 1949, and this is a Soviet friendship conference, and a man named Bondarchuk, who is a high-ranking Soviet official, attends this conference. And he sees a poster of John Wayne, and he begins to hear all about the speeches that John Wayne is making, uh, downgrading communism, saying we have to fight communism here and, and abroad, and very incendiary. He comes back and he tells Joseph Stalin about this man, John Wayne. And John Wayne, uh, Stalin, who's mad by this time, he's, he's drunk with murder. He has killed 35 million people or close to it. And he's in, he's in his worst killing stage, late 1940s, early 1950s. <coughs> Puts a hit out on John Wayne. The first way this gets out is this man Kapler is in the uh, gulag and he hears rumors about it from friends in the movie industries, many of whom are also doing jail time or coming to visit or just rumors and random intelligence that gets to him. And he tells some of them, you've got to get this word out to the United States to warn this guy Wayne. So the hit is out on John Wayne. Now, John Wayne is happily uh, living his life. It's the early 1950s. He's doing a movie called Hondo. Uh, his wife, his, this is his second wife, however, is divorcing him and wants dirt on him and sends some private investigators to Mexico. And during this period of time, um, they start seeing these investigators for his wife. And in investigating the investigators and sort of trying to protect Wayne from these investigators as his wife is sending to them, they discover other people who are tailing him. These are Soviet assassins. And Wayne's uh, security people, and security people, I think at Warner Brothers, then go to the FBI, and we then have a series of assassination attempts. They tried to kill Wayne in Mexico. They tried to kill Wayne a second time in the United States. The second time, um, Wayne is, uh, finds out about it, works with the FBI, they show up at the Warner Brothers lot, they come into his office, the FBI guys take them, put guns to their heads, Wayne drives them along with the FBI guys and a screenwriter named James Brandt uh, to a deserted beach somewhere in Southern California. Wayne puts a gun to their heads and shoots, but it's blanks. And these assassins are so scared that they say, you don't have to, you don't have to torture us, or, well, we'll work with you. And according to the story, 
um, it is, uh, they are termed. The next is uh, homegrown communists who are operating not on Stalin's orders, but on their own, attempt to kill Wayne at Warner Brothers in 1955. A stuntman, Yakima Kanut, who was very loyal to Wayne, starts to hear this rumor. And he has guy, he has other stuntmen, cowboys, who infiltrate the communist cells in Hollywood in the 50s and find out about it. And they, in this particular case, they get to the cell and they, they basically have a, a huge fight and they round up these communists and according to Kanut, put them on a plane to Russia, which I thought was a little bit incongruous, except in those days, you really didn't need, Americans didn't need passports to travel the world. Dwight Eisenhower was so popular, Americans didn't need, not, didn't need passports. It's possible they actually just put them on a plane and sent them to Russia. Now, I, I, I couldn't verify that. But in 1958, Wayne has a meeting with Nikita Khrushchev, and he says to Khrushchev, why are you trying to kill me? And Khrushchev says, I, th those were orders that Stalin gave in his last mad days. I rescinded those orders. I can't do anything about these homegrown communists who tried to kill you at the studio. I'll try to put a clamp on that. But we're no longer going to be trying to kill you. But you've got to watch out for Chairman Mao. He cannot be controlled. He doesn't listen to us, and he still has an order out on you. Fast forward to Ply Coup, Vietnam, way in 1966, is meeting with American troops, uh, Marines. There's a, a bullet flies past his head. They capture the Marines, go out into the hinterlands, capture the would be assassin, they bring him in front of John Wayne. He's got Chinese markings, he's got orders, he tells them he's on personal orders from Chairman Mao to kill John Wayne. So how do we know all this? Well, not, John Wayne didn't tell anybody about this. He didn't tell his family, he didn't tell his fans, he didn't tell the press. He didn't want anyone to know. He didn't want anyone to know about it. It starts off with a writer named Michael Munn, who uh, is a British film historian. He first hears about it when he meets Bob Hope doing a stage play, I think it's called How to Marry a Millionaire, which Hope was holding in London in the 70s. He starts to hear about it. Next, he meets with the British actor Peter Ustinov, tells him, oh yes, the communists have been trying to kill John Wayne for a couple of decades. Stalin tried to do it, uh, and then Mao tried to do it. Uh, well, how did Ustinov know? Well, he had just come back from China, and he'd heard about it from Chinese dissidents in Hong Kong, I suppose. They heard about his assassination attempt in, in Ply Ku. Next, uh, Munn talks to John Wayne. Wayne confirms all of it to Michael Munn. Next, uh, Munn has a conversation with um, Orson Welles, 1982. Welles confirms all of this and embellishes some of it. <clears throat> and tells him, yes, it's true. The communists were trying to kill John Wayne. Joseph Stalin was trying to kill John Wayne. It all gets put together in a book that Michael Munn writes in 2003 called John Wayne, The Man Behind the Myth. So uh, in terms of my information, how do I know that, well, I just explained it, that uh, there were a number of sources that include Yakima Kanut, screenwriter James Grant, Bob Hope, M Michael Munn, John Wayne himself, Peter Ustinov, uh, Chinese dissidents, Orson Welles. You know, we're getting now, I've, you know, listed six or seven pretty good sources on uh, how we know this. But again, it was not known at the time. John Wayne didn't want his family to know, didn't want his fans to know. Well, that gets to the second question that you've asked is, you know, uh, what proof was there that international communism arranged the attempted at assassination of John? Okay, so let's, let's move on here. So what proof is there that John Wayne's speech to the 1966 Trojans ended up in the famed Patton speech? Okay, 1966, which is the year that Wayne uh, evades this uh, assassination attempt at Ply Coup. He speaks to the, night, to the Trojans football team the night before a football game, Austin, Texas, University of Texas. The night before the game, Wayne 
does a bit of drinking, as he was wont to do, and gets into a big argument over the Vietnam War. And he's going on and on. We're going to go through those commie sons of guns like crap to a goose. We're going to wipe the, you know, the tail guns of our tanks with them and the incendiary language. Gets into a, a, a writer named Har Harley Ace Tinkham, who had been with the LA Times, takes exception to Wayne, walks up to Wayne. I cannot verify exactly what happened, because even though I have a number of witnesses, all of whom were too drunk to truly give me the exact details, but the story was that Tinkham takes a swing at Wayne. No, no, that, that uh, Tinkham tells Wayne, you ain't, and then he says something. Wayne takes a swing at Tinkham, they pull him back, doesn't have, the, the fight never materializes, but Wayne is giving ma mainly the patent speech to all of his sycophants at the hotel the night before the game. The next day, he makes a speech to the team. Now there's, some people have said that this was speech was similar to the patent speech in the 1970 movie Patton. Others have said it was, it was not so. But I don't think necessarily the speech to the team was really the, what happened. But what happens is, in that room, is a USC assistant football coach named Marv Gu. Marv Gu uh, is a very incendiary, fiery guy who happened to have been a gladiator in the movie Spartacus by Stanley Kubrick. And he has been patterned, pattering, pattering, pattering. None of those words are correct. Pattering. <laughs> Let's, let's start over again on that. He has been emulating this speech that uh, Kirk Douglas makes to the gladiators in Spartacus to the USC team for six years. He heard, hears Wayne, and he's heard some of Wayne's speech the night before because he arrived in the ballroom after coming home from a movie. And now he's hearing the speech. I believe that Goo starts channeling Wayne into an incendiary speech to the team about using their guts to grease their cleats and going through them like crap to a goose and conquest and all these different things. Way, uh, Goo, this is, and this, is, this is true, Goo is making the Patton speech to the USC football team for three years, four years prior to the movie Patton. Any player who was on that team could tell you that. Next, John Milius, a USC film student who later uh, wrote the screenplay for Dirty Harry, was a film school a student at the time. He starts hearing about these goo speeches. He has a friend named Ron Schwery. Schwery is a film student at the time. I believe that what happens is Milius somehow sneaks into the old gym at USC and hears Goo make this speech to the football team. Goo channeling John Wayne. John Millich's best friend is Francis Ford Coppola. At the time, Francis Ford Coppola is writing the screenplay for Pat. I believe that John Millich goes to Francis Ford Coppola and says, you got to put this in the movie. If you've read Patton's biography, uh, Ordeal and Triumph by Ladislaus Fargo. None of this stuff is in there. Omar Bradley, who is uh, doing the um, advising for the movie, he's not. He, he doesn't tell the, the filmmakers about this. I believe it comes from Marv Gu channeling John Wayne and ends up in the screenplay that Coppola writes. And I, it's originally written as an anti-war screed, but between the director Franklin Schaffner, who had actually work uh, it actually served with Patton in uh, North Africa um, and Milius uh, or not Milius uh, the, uh, the the great work of George C. Scott gets turned into a charismatic portra portrayal not a pro-war movie and not maybe even not even glorifying war but one that creates a great character portrait so that's how I believe that the speech that John Wayne makes the 1966 Trojans is channeled by John Wayne, and then by John Milius, and then by Francis Ford Coppola, and then eventually by George C. Scott. Very good. Moving on to our fourth uh, question here. What proof is there that John Wayne's conversation with Nikita Khrushchev in 1958 ended up in the final confrontation between Patton and the Russian general? Okay, so I'd alluded to this conversation earlier. 1958, Dwight Eisenhower calls up Duke Wayne and says, John, 
we want you to, to be at a Russian-Soviet friendship conference in New York, and Nikita Khrushchev will be there, and apparently he's a fan of yours. And Wayne is no fan of Nikita Khrushchev, but he's thinking, well, he's probably better than Joseph Stalin, so uh, it's, it's worth a try. And, you know, who knows? I, I, I'd like to meet the guy and find out what, what makes him tick. So he shows up, and Khrushchev meets him, and there's, it's the normal formalities, and then Khrushchev finally says, I understand you're a man who likes to drink. And Wayne says, uh, no, I heard the same about you. Khrushchev says, well, let's repair to a place, a uh, quiet place in the bar where we can speak privately. Wayne Khrushchev and um, a Russian, um, what, what's the word for, a translator, a translator. He's, the, he's Khrushchev's translator. Wayne is drinking tequila. I can never correctly pronounce the name of it. It's a, it's a difficult name to pronounce. Mexican tequila. Trans Forovito tequila or something along those lines. Anyway, I think uh, Khrushchev was drinking vodka. It's starting to get loose. This is when Wayne says, why are you trying to kill me? And when Khrushchev replies, well, that was Stalin in his final mad days. I rescinded that order. Wayne says, well, how come guys tried to kill me at Warner Brothers in 1955. He says, well, those were homegrown communists. <clears throat> I'll put the word out and try to try to do something about that, but I can't stop Chairman Mao. So watch out for him, especially if you go anywhere in, in Asia, which we'll find out later he does go in 1966. So he's sitting there talking to Khrushchev, and Khrushchev is drinking. Khrushchev starts to talk about, you know, I like your movies because they depict how the white man has put down the Indians. It's very similar to world history and how our history, how, how we were put down by the czars. And Wayne is not happy having cowboys described as, as, as Russian czars. But he lets it go. And then uh, Khrushchev finally it's just to a toast to the conquest of the world by the Soviet Union. And John Wayne looks at the uh, translator and he says, you tell this SOB that if he doesn't put that glass down, I'm going to knock him, knock him on, his, on his keister right now. And the translator says, I can't tell him that. We have to maintain diplomatic relations. And Wayne says, well, okay, fine. Well, if you look at the end of the movie, Patton, there's a scene where Patton is talking to a Russian general at the conclusion of World War II, and, and uh, would you like to have a drink with the Russian general? And he says, I tell the Russian general I do not care to drink with him or any other Russian son of a bitch. Cannot tell him that. Tell him that word for word. He repeats it, and the Russian general says, Sinka, uh, Sinka, Sin, which is tell him that uh, he too is a son of a bitch. And uh, uh, George C. Scott, as Pat, says, all right, I'll drink to that one son of a bitch to another. And they can have their toast. And I'm not even sure that this uh, event really happened. I don't know, I'm not even sure that that's in Farago's biography of Patton. I think that it comes from the Khrushchev uh, Wayne imbroglio. And I think it comes from John Wayne and the USC Film School. 1962, Daryl Zanuck makes the movie The Longest Day. The star of the movie is... is is uh, John Wayne. John Wayne is going to play Patton in the movie. Zanuck has the rights to the Patton movie. The Patton family has not allowed that movie to be made because they're convinced liberal Hollywood is not going to treat him right. But after the success of The Longest Day, with now Wayne now set to play Patton, Zanuck says, no, I can go ahead and I can make this movie. I've got enough imprimatur to make it on my own. Now we get past 1966, Wayne drops out of the Patton project because now he wants to make the Green Berets. Now they go, then they go to Rod Steiger to make the movie. He doesn't, he doesn't want to do it because it's, he says glorifies war. And eventually it goes to George C. Scott. But we get back to John Milius and Francis Ford Coppola and the USC Film School. Wayne is a USC graduate. A lot of people at USC who know John Wayne. I believe 
there's to, to quote Milius's screenplay from Apocalypse Now, rumors and random intelligence around the USC film school that there was a conversation between John Wayne and Nikita Khrushchev in 1958 in which Wayne threatened to punch the Soviet premier on his keister because he you know, basically said, we're going to bury you. And I think this gets to Milius, and I think Milius tells Francis Ford Coppola and infuses all of this wonderful pageantry and color into the screenplay Patton, which was written, as I say, an anti-war screed by Francis Ford Coppola in an effort to get America to get out of the Vietnam War. The movie is produced in 1970, the height of the war. It's only Schaffner's um, direction, because he was an admirer of Scott, who served under him, and Scott's charismatic performance that gives the performance such great color and makes it something that many military people have always loved. Finally, you have the Patton family had a lawsuit all set. They were going to, going to sue uh, 20th Century Fox. The day after the movie, the lawsuit was quietly taken away. They loved the performance. And they loved the scene where George C. Scott, as Patton, tells the Russian general, I don't care to drink with him or any other Russian suddenly gets you. It's, it's straight out of the conversation that John Wayne has with Nikita Khrushchev in New York in 1950. Very good. We're going to take a break right now. We're going to come back. All right. All right. So that's 31 minutes and 41 seconds. Good. What else did you want to cover? You, hey, I, that's it for me. You you ask me anything, okay. any, anything right. out of that you, you want to, and I'll be happy to uh, answer it. All right. <coughs> did that go okay? Yeah, very well. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you, you understood what I meant. Or did you? I, I, I finally you, did, I wanted, but I, I think it took me a while. while. Yeah. But well, I was, you know, I, just, I, know, I was, I know, I was you, so focused, you're focused on that. You I didn't want to have notes. I, I knew I had this in my head, but I didn't want notes because I didn't want to constantly be going to right. notes. Yeah. But, right. Um, it should be. It should be I get that. Here. But you kind of see yeah. why, you know, it, some of this has required some lengthy explanations that uh, are not necessarily that easy to do in the, the normal sure. Q&A. Oh, yeah. No, no, you did. It's really it's very interesting. Oh, well, I'll tell you what was interesting was discovering all this stuff. Oh, that. Because the only thing I had, the only reason I even started writing the book, well, you can, you can add, why don't you ask me why I started, what, what motivated me? Yeah. That's an interesting story okay. in and of itself. All right. Um, okay. That'll be the next question. It'll be what motivated you to write a oh, book? Man. I have that water. I almost drank the whole thing. Yeah. Are you good? Can you it up? No, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Um, I was thinking again of, you know, why have we not heard a lot about this? Well, that, you can ask that. Okay. I'll, I'll give you that, that answer. You know what that answer is. Okay. All right. Um, let me ask you that first, and then we'll get into the okay. last part. Okay. All right. You ready? And then what else did you want to cover? Oh, I'll get, I'll get, I'll get to it out of that. Okay. Pretty kitty. Welcome back. We are here with Steve Travers, and we're going to get right into this next question here. Why have we not heard about all of this before? You know, who's covering this up? up? Well, it's not a matter of it being covered up. It's It has been written about. It's, you can find it on the web. You can find it in Michael Munn's book. It's out there, but basically I think you're talking about uh, a, a myth or a lie that Hollywood has been telling itself for the better part of 60 years that there were no communists in Hollywood. I think uh, it's the, they turned McCarthyism into such a pejorative, and McCarthy didn't realize how right he was. But there were communists in Hollywood. There were communists in academia. There were communists in the government. Um, they had infiltrated many uh, of our... There were, much of the anti-war protest movement of the 1960s was originally funded by communist infiltrators, and then it grew 
into bigger things, and it wasn't entirely that, but much of its early genesis was. So, you know, it's one of these things. It's like the, the uh, Venona Papers. The Venona Papers, which comes out of the project that I talked about where the, uh, they discovered that uh, through cable traffic during World War II that there were uh, Soviets in, in the FDR's government, comes out in 1993, and it verifies everything. It verifies infiltration of Hollywood. It verifies Alger Hiss's guilt and much, much more. If the tables were turned, if it was um, Republican Nazis, you see movies, documentaries, it'd be taught in every school, it would be, it would be the, the guiding light, the, the thing that they want everyone to know about Republicans. In the meantime, the list of Republican Nazis um, does not exist because none could be found walking around on the earth. So uh, the, the left has always tried to uh, portray this. And you don't even see movies about McCarthy. Uh, you see fictionalized versions of McCarthy. Why? Because if, if you made a real movie about McCarthy, you have to have the Hollywood 10 who actually were paid Soviet spies and, and traitors. So they have to fictionalize it and, and have some screw-faced Republican going after some you know, nice Jewish writer or something like that. Okay, and that moves us right on to this next question here. What uh, motivated you to write the book? Well, I wrote a book that came out in 2007 called One Night, Two Teams, Alabama versus USC in the Game to Change the Nation. And this is the story of how, uh, again, the USC football team goes into Alabama, integrated, plays an all-white Crimson Tide team, beats them, and has such an effect that it, um, well, Alabama was already integrating, but it had the effect really with the fans and the media in Alabama of making it a smooth transition towards integration. And while researching this book, I kept talking to all these old-timers at USC, Tom Kelly and Mike Walden and Marv Gu and Craig Fertig and all these guys who, had, who, who were there, many of whom are not with us anymore, unfortunately. And I kept referring to <clears throat> this wild weekend that John Wayne had in Austin, Texas in 1966. Wayne getting really drunk and getting into a fight with a liberal writer over the Vietnam War and then making an incendiary speech to the USC football team that fired him up to go out to beat Texas. Nobody was making the... Oh, then the other thing was, all these football players at USC, they go, the night before the game, they go to see um, Patton. And they come back from the movie Patton, and they're all going, that's Coach Go. <laughs> or Coach McKay. Where did they, did the writer of this movie get all of this from Coach Goo? So if you're asking, you know, what proof do I have? Well, here, you know, this is anecdotal evidence. All these football players are coming back going, Man, half the stuff Patton was saying in this movie was stuff that Marv Goo has been telling us for four years. So this is really where I get this idea that, did this really happen? And, you know, and then the more I study it, John Wayne was up for the, for the role of Patton you know, with, uh, with Zanuck. And John Milius was in the USC film school. And they knew Ron Schwery. And he was sneaking in to listen to Marv Goo's speeches. His Goo's speeches for four years were identical. He had switched from the Spartacus speech to the Patton speech, basically. <laughs> now, what happened with uh, John Wayne's hairdresser? Ah, well, the night before the game, his hairdresser, who I, I believe his name was Larry Butterworth. And I don't think he was a big drinker, but went in Rome, you know. And apparently he was mixing drinks. And he was also trying to dance with a lady. And he gets uh, into a big fight with this writer, um, Tinkum. And he's mixing drinks. And he had a bad heart anyway. And he, uh, he passes out. And Wayne tells Schwery to take him to his room. And the next day, he's, he's dead. And John Wayne literally has to carry his body to the hearse. Or not the hearse, but the, uh, the, the car that came to pick up his body. And 
paramedics, I suppose, at the Stephen F. Austin Hotel. So he had drank too much, and he died in the middle of the night. Right. And was there an incident with war protesters on the USC campus that inspired Wayne to make the Green Beret? Yeah, Wayne was um, at the um, Shriners Auditorium across the street from the school, and he and his secretary walked across the campus, and he saw a Marine walking. He was in dress blues, and he only had one arm. He had lost his arm in one of the earliest battles in, like, 65, and he was being heckled by war protesters. And Wayne ran over, and first he went to the Marine, and he walked him to his car and signed an autograph and told him, thank you for your service. Then he w ran back to the hecklers, and he says, what's the matter with you? And, you know, he finally finishes it with this big shrug of his shoulders and what's happened to this country, which, you know, kind of says it all. This was 1965, and then he decides he's going to make the Green Beret, and the Green Berets and honor the guys who've been fighting over. Anything else you wanted to cover today? No, I think that's that's good. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, get all this stuff Absolutely. explained as best I could. It's uh, extremely interesting. Uh, definitely have to read the book, The Duke, The Longhorns, and Chairman Mao, John Wayne's Political Odyssey by Stephen Travers. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Okay. All right. Very good.